you were here, you, you don't know, you were here uh, when Angie uh, and Ashley were here, Angie Thomas and Ashley Woodford. Uh, they were here to talk about this beautiful book, Black Blackout, which I actually purchased. And uh, you, you take up the second chapter and it's Mask Off, which I think is interesting in light of what we're talking about today. And your latest book um, <laughs> is, is amazing because it's about baseball. And I'm trying to find, I want to make sure I get it right. I know it's something about pitching. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's fast pitch. I know I got it, Smith. I got it. Fast pitch. Let me welcome New York Times, number one, New York Times bestselling author, Nick Stone. Hello. And if I just looked up, it's right over your shoulder. So it I is over look my over shoulder. your shoulder. You know, it's right shameless, there. It's right. Shameless plugging, shameless plugging. No, nah, it's important. We got to do that because writers are, um, to me, everything uh, foundationally. And we don't, to me, give enough honor to real writers, people who are grinding, uh, not the folk doing it for commerce. So um, talk about, first of all, talk about doing this blackout because this is, I think, anybody that has a young person, you have to have this book. This is Black Joy in a beautiful, beautifully written uh, women coming together to give you black joy during a blackout, beautifully done. Um, and writing, I talked with Angie and Ashley about writing with other people and handing it off. How, how hard was that? Because writing is such a singular, solitary space for miss, most of us. Honestly, it wasn't hard at all. Like it's, it's one thing to have to hand it off to somebody you don't know, but all of us are friends, which was really helpful in this process. So we like trusted each other's work, we knew we were all going to come with our A game and we all do such different types of writing that it kind of, it came together in a very cohesive way. Um, and that book, I think, really helped us all last summer during the thick of the pandemic, like the pandemic had like just started and nobody had any idea what was going on. Um, the death of George Floyd had just happened and we needed to do something to help us get up out of the funk that we had all slipped into. So we, we wound up writing these love stories, stitching them together, and uh, very, very happy with, with what came out of it. So what inspired this story uh, that starts in a subway at 526 p.m.? What inspired so, it? Okay, so this whole book came together. Um, it's the brainchild of Danielle Clayton. So she's like the first name listed on the book. And she decided that we should all write a book of these interconnected stories and she basically told us, she told each one of us where our story was going to take place and what romantic trope we were supposed to be covering. So I was on the subway and my romantic trope was the secret crush. Um, and honestly, I was really excited to have this confined space that I had to work within because it really made me be a little bit more creative when it came to how I told the story. And it, it stretched me out a little bit, which was a lot of fun. Um, the hardest part about writing that story was figuring out how one gets off of the subway if there's an emergency, because those instructions are not just plastered everywhere as you would assume. Um, so yeah, I'm in Atlanta. I don't even know all that much about the New York subway system, but I know a whole lot now, including how to get off. I love it. This is great. So I, I hadn't gotten blackout, but as I often do when I come on with Karen, uh, I find something I need to order. So I just ordered it. Um, but I've got sons who have read Dear Martin. Um, so I wanted mm -hmm. to ask a little bit about the trajectory from Dear Martin um, to, um, to First Pitch and how you got uh, to telling this story. Uh, so Dear Martin deals with some real life issues and uh, we can see a jumping off point. How do you get to telling the story of First Pitch? So, okay, so Dear Martin was my debut novel. Um, I have two sons myself. They are five and nine. The five-year-old just tried to bust up in here. And my husband <laughs> was like, my husband, my husband grabbed him by the collar. He's like, no, you can't go in there. Mommy's on an interview. But uh, in 2012, I was pregnant with my first kid. And... Um, I, I just actually had just given birth when I found a, found out about the death of Jordan Davis. So I was pregnant when Trayvon Martin was killed. And then when, Tra when Jordan Davis was killed, my son was five months old. And there was something about like, now I have this little black boy child that belongs to me, that I'm, that I'm responsible for, for taking care of and, and ushering through the world in as safe a way as possible. 
And so I really wanted to explore what the cause of a black boy losing his life over loud music, like what, what are the, the structures in society that would make a person pull out a gun because a black boy has his music turned up too loud. Um, so that's, that's what became Dear Martin. Because of Dear Martin, I had a lot of, so Dear Martin is aimed at like 14, like seventh grade up, I would say. Because of Dear Martin though, I had a lot of elementary school teachers who would come to me and be like, we love the way that you discuss race and racism in Dear Martin, but I cannot read this book to my third graders. Is there something that you recommend instead? So I wound up writing a book called Clean Getaway. Now Clean Getaway is also a book about race and racism, but it follows a young man named Scoob. He's 12. He's going on this road trip across the American South with his white grandmother. So my kids have a white grandma. My husband is biracial. Um, Mother-in-law is very, very Russian. And it's a lot of fun. But she also was married to a Nigerian man in like the 1970s. So it's thinking about what life might have been like for them. Now, they were in Russia. So like I'm thinking about life in the United States. And I used the idea of an interracial relationship in the 60s as a jumping off point to tell a story about race and racism focused on an 11-year-old. That book <laughs> featured a young lady. The young man in that book, Scoob, had a crush on a young lady named Shanice. And Shanice is the protagonist of Fast Pitch. So Fast Pitch is basically a sandlot retelling about a softball team of little Black girls. And um, in this book, she's trying to lead her all black softball team. This is the first of its kind. And it's like 2021, right? First of its kind ever in this particular league. She's trying to lead them to a league championship, really for the sake of making history. But as she's working to get her team there, she finds out that her great grandfather, who was also a baseball player, was prevented from making history because of a crime that he allegedly committed. Um, she finds out from the great grandfather's little brother that he was set up. And so she sets out on this quest trying to find out the truth while also trying to lead her team to this championship. And it's really a book about family and legacy and how legacy and present reality can create some tension sometimes. So I'm really excited about it. And uh, yeah, it's been a ride. I was thinking it was gonna be, there was a TV show that got canceled, I think too soon. Uh, was starring Kylie Burnberry. Uh, she played uh -huh. a, a pitcher in Major League Baseball. It was she called was pitcher, Pitch. Right. It was, and I love that show so much because she was, you know, breaking barriers and it was just, it was, it was heating up and then it got canceled. And I was like, oh. And then we had the young lady in Little League. Um, and I forgot her name. Gosh, who went on and, and she was starring in everything at that point. Go ahead, Smith. Tell me in my ear. Do you know her name? I, I think. All right. Uh, but she she ended up, you know, she wanted to play basketball, but she, you know, was in the World Series, the Boys World Series and was killing it. So I said, oh, Monet Davis. Thank you, Smith. Um, so I was like, fast pitch is going to be something like that. But of course, Nick Stone is never going to do something that's going to be straight over the pit, over the oh, over no. the plate. It's going to take you no. on a journey. So uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. And I love and I've said this many times on these airways. I love reading young adult writers because it seems like y'all you know i wouldn't categorize you because i hate the labels but when you can tap into that young thing you know it, we all were young and it it brings us back to i think centering our humanity because usually kids have you know very little filter as it relates to right and wrong like they know and and they're they're moved by that and they're not jaded and that's what i really get out of reading a lot of books inspired uh by young people so i just wanted want to say that i just Go like ahead. pretending i'm still young so there's that <laughs> and then there's that nick stone is here the latest book is fast pitch starsky is here as well dr reverend reverend dr starsky wilson see there you go trolling again so i wanted to say so i want to ask about um um fast pitch in this sense um you are a spellman grad right uh, I think I got that right. Um, and um, I just wanted to know what what we were talking earlier about artistry. Uh, and, and, and I think about environments that help to nurture art. Um, what were the things about either that environment as Feldman? Do, are there things that you attribute to that context, that environment that helped to nurture uh, your writing now? Um, any inspirations from that 
uh, from that space? Uh, or just or was it just kind of preparatory space? Or, or none of that, it all came from somewhere else. I mean, really, it's all of that. Um, Spelman is where I figured out who I was, right? Like I, I've spent all of these years in these majority white spaces making do. And I, I think most of us who mm. have spent time in majority white spaces, we do a really good job of like, turn on the white girl voice and doing what you got to do to just get through the day without having to punch somebody. Um, so going to a place like Spelman and realizing how much more diverse this all black girl school was than my high school, like it was astonishing to me. And it was at Spelman that I realized that all of the lies that I believed about myself as a result of being in these majority white spaces were completely untrue. Um, you mentioned Dear Martin earlier. There's a, there's a scene in Dear Martin um, where the main character has gotten into Yale, early decision, and there's a white boy in class who is just like butthurt about it because he got deferred. So they wind up having this conversation about affirmative action, but it turns out these two kids, the black boy and the white boy, they're literally equally qualified. But when the black boy tells the white boy what his ACT score was, and the white boy finds out that it was higher than the white boy's ACT score, the white boy's like, there's no way, like, nah. I literally pulled that from my life. Like my senior year of high school, I had a girl tell me there was no way I got a higher ACT score than she did. And having those kinds of messages, either directly or indirectly tossed at you for your entire life, like, I didn't even know that I could write fiction. It took me being surrounded by beauty and creativity and power and culture, a culture that I was told was like uncouth, like being surrounded by people who looked like me and who moved the way that I did naturally. It really helped me to see that like, not only can black people make art, black people are art and black people kind of originated art. So coming to that realization, is what helped me to see that like, oh no, no, all of this stuff that's inside of you, it needs to go out into the world because these people are confused about where art even came from, clearly. Yeah. Talk. What, was some of the, what was some of the lies that you believed before you got to Spelman? It's a lot of inferiority, you know? Like there was a, like, okay, really great example. I never saw myself in books growing up, like ever. I grew up reading Judy Bloom and Lewis Sacker and like I love and I loved these books to the depth of my soul. I loved me some Encyclopedia Brown, though a white boy named Leroy was like, wait, really? I was a little confused about that. But I did love Encyclopedia Brown. I loved Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. I loved all of these books. But when I hit about seventh grade and I realized that, like, wait, I'm not in them. Like the message that sends to a kid to never see yourself in a thing you're told you have to be able to do. Like reading and writing are things that we have to be able to do. So to never see yourself represented in those spaces, it's like, wait, does that mean I don't exist? Like what is, like, I don't know what I can and can't do. Like you mm. don't see yourself falling in love or saving the day or having adventures. And so you kind of wonder if people like you are allowed to do those things. So getting to Spelman and like diving headfirst into Alice and Tony and Zora and like all of these, and even men, Langston and Ralph Ellison and, and um, oh gosh, Black Boy, Baldwin. Richard Wright, Richard Baldwin, Wright. Yeah. Richard Wright, like reading their work, I was like, oh snap, this is like a thing that I can do. So yeah, th those messages, man. Or kids what, what, or was, just... what was the book? So for me, same upbringing, love to read. But then I found Maya Angelou. And mm. I had to be about 12. And then it was like off to the races. Then it's like yeah. every Gloria Naylor. Who else can I read? You know, it's like off to the races. What was the book where you were like, oh, OK. And I'm sure it didn't. It wasn't at Spellman. I'm sure you had to read a book before Spellman. Literally the year before I was 17. It was the color purple. Okay. Literally, I was 17. I had just graduated high school. And I mean, you spend, you know, I matriculated through, I said, majority white spaces. And so the stuff we had to read was like The Great Gatsby and The yep. Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Scarlet Letter and Womp 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 Dead White Men Everywhere. Like, right, right, <laughs> we didn't right. see books written by people like us. So I just didn't, I like didn't know. And then also there's this weird 
sideways messaging that if it's not teachable, it's not good enough, right? So then you have this idea that like, oh, these books by these black people, we don't learn them in school. So clearly they're not good literature. Like they're not, they're not considered literature, which is total BS. It took me though, picking up the color purple and not only seeing, that was my first book that I read that was epistolary, that was like written as these like journal entry letter type things. And it was also my first book that I saw any kind of queer representation on the page. So that book just mind blown open. And then I think the next thing I picked up was Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which oh, wow. again, and yeah. then and then you, of course you just go into the rabbit hole then. Yeah. 